It's Christmas, and as families around the world find ways to market in these unprecedented circumstances, America's political right would have you believe there's a war on Christmas, a war on religion. Over the last few decades, conservatives have rendered this one nation under God divisible, exploiting and weaponizing religion for partisan political gain. And nowhere was this more evident in 2020 than in the confirmation hearings of Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, where her, where her Christian faith became a rallying cry for the religious right. As the debate around her continued, conservative radio talk show host Hugh Hewitt went so far as to say the left despises every person of any faith. And look, the elections... They came soon afterwards, and despite there being a choice between an amoral, irreligious narcissist and a church-going Catholic, the largest faith groups in the country overwhelmingly voted for the former. More than 80% of white evangelicals and more than 50% of white Catholics chose Donald Trump. This is yet again an example of how some in our political class fuel culture wars to distract from our far more consequential splits. In times like these, it's important to remember that a nation so divided is together facing profound challenges that transcend any political or religious beliefs. As we just discussed, a record number of families are going to food banks. Millions of Americans have become unemployed or have lost their homes. Tens of millions are living below the poverty line. And a pandemic that shows no signs of slowing down has already killed more than 300,000 Americans. So how does a country in such a state unite and move forward? Perhaps it begins with the right diagnosis of what's actually wrong. One man has been saying that more than anything else, America has a moral malady. Dr. William Barber, a reverend and a leader of the Poor People's Campaign, an organization founded by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, he writes that too often our attempts to diagnose what ails us cannot get past the tired debates of left versus right politics. He says Christian nationalism is threatening our moral and social health and that the only thing that will save America is to fundamentally change our national priorities to have a moral revolution. Earlier, I spoke with Reverend Barber about all of this. Reverend, you've spoken a lot about the need for a moral revolution in the US. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly? How does that kind of revolution happen? Well, first of all, let me thank you for having me on. Um, when I talk about morality, I'm talking about our deepest moral values that come out of our constitution like the establishment of justice, promoting the general welfare, providing for the common defense, uh, equal protection under the law, making lifting the poor and the least of these priority. The center of any vision for change is how do we treat the sick, the poor, the stranger, the immigrant. And we must have a moral revolution of values in this country because right now, establishment of justice seems to be the very thing that so many politicians want to work against. It seems that they want to establish injustice. Uh, they make sure that they have all the money they need, all the health care they need, but they don't want to make sure that people have what they need. That's the establishment of injustice. They don't seem to want to take promote the general welfare. They want to promote the welfare of Wall Street and the welfare of a few. Yes. Uh, it seems that they don't want to lift from the bottom. They want to lift from the middle class or trickle down from the top. So we have a moral framework that is causing us all kinds of economic and other inequalities because the framing is not rooted in. And, and lastly, some people say we want to heal the nation. Well, the Constitution said there's only one way to heal the nation, to have, have what we call um, domestic tranquility, and that is to establish justice. So, Reverend, when a lot of people, uh, when they think of morality in politics and public life here in America, they think of evangelical Christians, of the Republican Party, of the quote-unquote moral majority movement on the right. How did the right end up basically owning Christianity in America? Well, I don't know if they would say they own it. You know, I, I don't use that term left and right. I think uh, I have real problems with it because it's not theological framework is not what we do in the academy, but for, for conversational sake, they worked hard at it. I mean, the Koch brothers said in the 1970s that they were no longer going to try to elect Messiah candidates. They were going to build a movement. They want to take over the airwaves. They were going to build think tanks. Uh, they were going to fund, you know, these religious extremists who trace, whose ancestry traces all the way back to the religionists who endorsed slavery, the religionists who 
fought against Dr. King, the civil rights movement. So it's not new. These are the same religionist mentality that stood against Franklin Delano Roosevelt and called him a communist when he wanted social security and, and labor rights and minimum wage. So it's been around. It's just gotten, it's exacerbated. Yeah. It's had presidents like Trump and others and that push it. But we also have to note uh, now, I believe we're seeing a rising of, of, of religious figures, Jewish, Muslims, and Christians that are saying, wait a minute, M most of the stuff they talk about is not even at the center of any of our religious faiths when it comes to talking about justice, the least of these, and the uplift for the poor. So they've worked hard, but also sometimes the so-called religious left has stepped back. Now we've got to step forward and be engaged. Yes. To be clear, to be clear for our viewers, uh, just to get a sense of where you're coming from, for you, Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, uh, is much more of a uh, figure associated with social justice and fighting poverty and helping the stranger uh, than someone uh, who is all about fighting abortion or homosexuality or locking people up. Yeah, not only for me, but for the scriptures. You won't find the last three, three things you mentioned ever on the lips of Jesus, locking people up, abortion, and hating gay people. What you will find Jesus saying is a concern for the poor, the least of these, uh, the, those that have been brokenhearted, the oppressed, the, least, the, the sick, the immigrant. You find it in all of his sermons. In fact, he goes so far to say that those who don't uh, uh, focus on those things like justice are engaging in what Jesus calls the, the, the lesser matters of the law. That's the problem with white evangelicalism. They can say what they believe, but then they run into Jesus. That's why you never hear them say, Jesus said this, Jesus said this. They don't say that because he didn't say it. Even just as a matter of a historical figure. And so they keep running into, they have a Jesus problem. Right? They have a Jesus problem, therefore they have a justice problem, therefore they're so out of line with the fundamental base of Christianity. If we were in the ancient world, we would have had a Nicene Council by now and declared white evangelicalism a form of her heresy. Those are strong words, uh, and you've said similar things before. In 2018, you wrote about the, quote, four diseases threatening America, racism, poverty, environmental devastation, and the war, econ war economy, and you said that they're all sanctified by the heresy of Christian nationalism. What do you mean by that? And isn't it dangerous uh, for you to be accusing other Christians of being heretics? I'm not accusing other Christians. That's the point. I think you're right. It would be dangerous to call other Christians heretics. It's not dangerous to say folk that are trying to hijack Christianity as being heretics. That's what Frederick Douglass did when he said, I love the Christianity of Jesus, but I hate the religion of the slave master. That's what Dr. King said when he said, when I ride across the country and I see these um, uh, churches with the high steeple, I wonder what kind of people worship there. When he declared that, um, the, 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 that um, the church was supposed to be the thermostat of society, not the thermometer of society, when he said at the death of four little girls that were blown up in a church in Birmingham, who killed them? And one of the things he named was those who were in clergy robes who stood on the sidelines. And so it's, 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 it would be more dangerous not to call it out. It is more dangerous to let a kind of religiosity, nationalism rise up that embraces racism embraces homophobia, embraces xenophobia, uh, embraces anti-gayism, and does not deal with the real issues that ought to be at the center of faith and the center of a just society. But even if we uh, grant you the, even if we grant the argument that, look, there is extremism on the right among some white evangelical Christians, uh, there is hate on the right among some groups, even if we grant that point, isn't the reality still that across the board, it is conservatives in this country who are more comfortable talking about faith, talking about religion, talking about the church, and it's Democrats, it's liberals who have become the party, the movement of secular liberal America have almost pushed people of faith away. And I'm not talking about Joe Biden here, who is, of course, a church-going Catholic, but younger, more liberal Democrats who aren't, who aren't that comfortable talking about religion or God or the church. Well, sure. I mean, again, just because people talk about the church doesn't mean they're comfortable talking about religion. Or you know, the slaves used to say everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. They knew that the slave masters talked a lot about religion, but they didn't <laughs> talk a lot about Jesus or God. 
But then on the other hand, I think, yes, liberal, so those who use the framework of liberalism or being liberal have too often walked away from faith, who've given up the moral discourse in the public square. And by the way, let me just say, from a faith perspective, uh, we challenge Democrats as well. It's not like Jesus, you need to get Jesus out of the Republican Party and get him in the Democratic Party. It's not like you need to get the prophets out of the, the, out of the, out of the liberal, I mean, the, um, the Libertarian Party and get them into the Democratic Party. No, we need a moral critique. And too many, Democrats, for instance, tend to run from poverty. Republicans tend to racialize poverty. We need a reckoning and a re reconstruction around the issue of poverty. How do you ignore 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country before COVID? How do you ignore 300,000 people dying in the midst of COVID? But the majority of them are poor and low wealth people. How do you how do you how you juxtapose how do you not deal with so, 250,000 people dying from from poverty and low wealth before COVID? So we need a moral reckoning across the board. Okay. So let's talk about the uh, poverty crisis, the economic crisis, the COVID crisis in America. Uh, you and I spoke last, uh, back in April, I think it was, after Congress passed the first COVID relief bill. They've just finally passed the second this year, uh, this week, and it's a fraction of the last one, provides less money to people than last time around, uh, uh, you know, lower unemployment benefits, no funding for state or local governments. What is your reaction to the COVID relief bill that Democrats and Republicans passed this week? Well, first of all, the, the first one they passed was bad. 84% of the money went to corporations and banks. It didn't address the issue of 11 million undocumented workers, many who pay more taxes in this country than the wealthiest, wealthy people in this country. It didn't guarantee people a living wage, didn't guarantee people health protection from pre-existing conditions. And everybody said it was a CARES Act, when really it was a, a kind of an act. It wasn't really a caring act. I mean, it did some things, but it did in no way what needed to be done. And we challenged Democrats even who, who, who supported it. They said they had to get something done. Now we've got this next bill, and it's a Christmas mess, not a Christmas miracle. I told somebody day, it's almost like we want to say to people, I, I wish you a Herod Christmas, because what they're doing seems more like Herod in the Bible, who caused more pain with his policy than he caused liberation. And it's terrible. I mean, the, and the people who are fighting people are in Congress. They got quarter million dollar salaries, free health care paid for by the people, all of these protections, but they're not protecting the constituency. And it's going to hurt the whole economy. I mean, we, we, we're in a major recession that's operating like recessions don't normally operate because it's coming from the hospitality in industry out. Normally it comes from the manufacturing industry out. So the people who are in the lowest rung, who are also suffering the most from COVID, are also being hit the most. They're being called essential workers, yes. but being treated like they're expendable. I do not like, I think it is a terrible bill, and I cannot join those who want to shout and say, oh, this is a great, this, we, this for Christmas. It is pitiful that what we are, what this bill has done. Yeah. It is less than, I think the reason was $3 trillion, and now you go to $900 billion, which is not even 30% of what yeah. originally was needed so to begin with. Fixed it in long term. One last question before we run out of time. A lot of the candidates who ran for the Democratic presidential nomination spoke uh, at a poor people's campaign rally you organized in 2019. Uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Biden and Harris will soon be off in office as president and vice president. Do you believe they will fight for poor people or do you believe they will let the poor down as previous Democratic presidents have, sadly? All parties have let us down in some ways. Some have done a little bit better than others. Biden said he wanted ending poverty to be at the center of his theory for change. So we have to hold him to that. We can't let them let us down. And that's why just a week or so ago, we met with the Biden domestic policy team, Ambassador Rice and others, and we said to them, if you're serious about healing the nation, you've got to heal the body. And the only way you heal the body is you've got to address systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy. The only way to heal the body is you've got to have long-term stimulus and raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and guarantee everybody health care and make sure that we have sick leave and unemployment. You cannot heal the nation without healing the body. You've got to increase food stamp programs. You've got to change the poverty measurement so we really know what we're dealing with. You have to make sure we have an infrastructure program that reaches into poor and low-wealth communities. You can't heal the nation unless you heal the body. That's what we put on the table. We've asked for a White House conference 
after they get inaugurated because we got we got to push 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 we can't quit on this Indeed, we cannot quit. Reverend Barber, uh, thank you for your time. We appreciate you taking time out for us during the holiday period. Merry Christmas. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.